So hello and welcome to the Ken and Medway Medical School Virtual Open Day 2024. This is your opportunity to find out everything you need to know about studying at KMMS from the comfort of your armchair. Over the next 90 minutes we'll be chatting to several members of the KMMS community including teaching and professional service staff and current medical students to give you an insight into the course, life as a medical student and what we look for when selecting the next generation of doctors. Whether you've got questions about the course, accommodation or finance and what to do when you are not studying, you can send them in to us via YouTube or Facebook in the live comments section on the screen and we'll get them answered for you. If you have any more personal questions regarding your entry requirements, please send them in to admissions at kmms.ac.uk. A final bit of housekeeping, as we're all on the line from various locations, do bear with us if we encounter any technical gremlins. We'll look out for those and get them as sorted as soon as we can. Now we've got a full schedule today that includes presentations and Q&A sessions with the KMS staff and students. Let's begin with this short film, Why Current Students Chose to Study at KMMS. One thing that really attracted me to KMMS was the fact that it's a new medical school. I like the new and forward thinking approach to most things to be honest and I thought a new medical school will have a new revised way of doing things and I was pleasantly surprised. They are doing, trying new things out and it's going well. I liked the fact it was new um, and I also liked that it was one of the medical schools that still do dissection because a lot of places have stopped doing that now and for me it was close to home as well. One of my favourite things about KMS are the students. I find everyone's really friendly even between the year groups. It's just a very nice community feel and as well as that the staff. I find the staff really supportive and they're really encouraging and I think that's a really good environment to learn medicine. I really like how it's sort of like a family because the year group's kind of small and you get to know everyone really quickly as well as just the like our lecturers and all the people that teach us they're very passionate about what they do and it's very helpful in terms of learning content that you can find quite difficult. So my favourite thing about KMMS is that we're a, a diverse cohort so everyone knows each other but we all appreciate each other's different backgrounds and also with our focus on person-centred care we can really apply ourselves to become great doctors in the future. And joining me now to discuss what makes KMMS unique is Interim Undergraduate Programme Director Dr Anna Oliveira. very much Daisy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Anna Oliveira. I'm the, at the moment interim undergraduate program director uh, for the Kenton Medway Medical School um, and it's really a pleasure to to be here and I hope um, uh, I have the possibility to see you in person in a, in a near future also. Um, so I'm I'm a pharmacist by background. Um, I came from from Portugal almost 10 years ago um, and I, I've been working in medical education uh, for quite a few years now, more than 10. Um, and I was attracted by KMS by being a new school and uh, I wanted and I was I'm here since 2020. So before we open and uh, until now, it's head of year one uh, at KMS. So it's here from the start and it's been quite an adventure. Uh, a very passionate and rewarding adventure that I hope you want to be part of. And, and having said that, I'm sure you want to know about uh, the program and, and what it can be uh, expected from you if you choose to apply for MMS. So if we could have the PowerPoint and I can, I can start. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So welcome, as I said, and if you can have the, the next slide. So who, who are we? Um, well, KMMS is a, a joint venture. It's a joint venture between two universities, Canterbury Christchurch University and also the University of Kent. They're relatively near each other, don't worry. Um, so walking distance, if you like to walk 35, 40 minutes, but there are buses, you can cycle wherever you prefer. Um, so it's, it's quite nice because you, both staff and students are part of both universities and, and have the advantage of, of benefiting from everything both universities have from facilities to activities that you will hear today um, 
that some, some colleagues will talk about. As a new medical school, KMMS has a partner medical school, so it's a partnership with a, a, a long established medical school, and in our case, it's the Brighton and Sussex um, Medical School. If we um, move to the next slide, please, thank you. So what's our vision? Now, I'm, I'm sure um, all medical schools want very good doctors, want first class doctors. So we want to graduate first class um, doctors, but also first class medical education and research um, doctors. And we want doctors that really have an excellence in person centered medical care in the UK. And the person centered component, you're going to hear me talk about this again in a couple of new slides. And, and you'll hear also uh, later on Mr. Joel Petsch talking in the curriculum about how important this is. And this is something that we are quite proud of KMMS. Um, and we hope that all our students can achieve that, um, have all that foundation when they graduate and continue to develop that in future. So we want our medical graduates to be to have all the knowledge, all the skills, and all the attributes that make those excellent doctors. And as you know, and I'm sure you're hearing the news about some of the, of the changes in the NHS, the struggles of NHS, and we want to start prepared to be part of um, the NHS and, and be that, that uh, force within the NHS. If we have the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and we have a series of values besides our mission that we want all staff and all colleagues and all uh, students um, to to believe and, and behave accordingly. Um, and these values were set um, by staff a long time ago, um, which I'm sure is quite a, a collaborative in, environment to set this and what are really our true beliefs. And we want our students to have these values and develop them, um, and if needed, with our support on. We want them to be brave. We want them to be brave to believe that they can do what they are set to do. To be brave to come and talk to us if they need any help. To be brave to come to talk with us if we are not doing everything we could or if we're doing something that is okay but we could do a bit better and and that's great uh, i really enjoy when students come to me and say oh anna you know this part of the curriculum is great but have you thought in um and it's really good to have that open channel of communication and have students that are brave in in all senses and i hope that what the students develop um throughout their, their program we want our students and our staff and everyone to be kind. I want students to be kind to, to colleagues, to be kind to their peers, and to especially to be kind to themselves and look after themselves and, and know and put that as a, as a first priority. We obviously want um, all our students to be respectful to each other and, and colleagues. Um, we want them to be passionate. Um, it, and it's interesting, you just heard in this video, um, one of our students talking about uh, staff being passionate. And I, I'm really glad to hear that. I, I think I am quite passionate. I teach pharmacology um, and I, I absolutely love it. Uh, and I hope to pass that passion into, my, uh, into the students when I'm talking with them. Um, and we want you to be passionate. We want to be passionate about medicine. And within me medicine, you might be passionate about specific things and you might want to you know, be part of this uh, sub society or you want to, to embrace this research project. And we want that. We want to, to feel that you're passionate about something and support you throughout. Um, we want you to be collaborative um, and, you know, collaborative in your projects, collaborative and know how to learn, uh, know how to work in a team, apologies, because that's going to be your future. You'll have to always collaborate. Um, so we want that and we, we want you to be innovative. Um, we like innovation, everyone likes, um, and we want you to, to have those principles and how can you be innovative? Where can you be innovative? And we want you to be curious, be curious, be curious about medicine, be curious about knowing what's the next step. Um, be curious today about your program, ask your questions. Um, we're, we're here to answer, so always be curious. Next slide, please. 
What makes KMMS different? Well, I said I would talk about person-centered approach and, and that's absolutely correct. We are proud to say we have a person-centered approach and that is from day one um, in year one. And you'll hear uh, Mr. Petsch talking in a bit about the curriculum and you'll see right one of the first modules you'll have has person-centered in the name. Um, because it, it is really needed. A, a, a medical doctor is going to work with people, is person-centered. Uh, either those people are their patients, carers, family, whoever is working with people. We want that person-centered approach. Um, we have early clinical experience. So from early on, our students go into their GP, the general practice and community uh, placements, and they have in year one, six weeks of, of, of um, placements currently. Uh, so we have that early clinical experience since year one, and we try to integrate that with the rest of the curriculum. We have a mission of widening participation, and it's, it's um, it's incredible to see and I'm very proud that we are uh, achieving more and more that, that goal of, of KMMS. Um, we have two universities, as I mentioned, and that comes with several colleagues with expertise, um, research projects, sometimes even summer um, projects that you can be part of if you, if you wish. So it gives you, it opens doors to a lot of strengths, a lot of expertise. Uh, activities, you know, it can be part of any society, so both universities, etc. Um, and we had the opportunity to look at our curriculum. And yes, we are mapping to write in Sussex Medical School, but we have the opportunity to look at curriculum and have an, a cutting edge curriculum that we hope is innovative and that we like to revise um, also as we go. And joining probably with the last bullet point, that we are very lucky that we have a diverse and specialist and modern learning environment, especially when we're talking about uh, buildings that were just um, built, for instance, or the use of, of uh, digital learning environments like we're doing today. Um, and altogether, um, I'm hoping we, we have that um, innovative curriculum uh, for you. KMMS values, personal qualities that people require in a doctor. So again, since year one, you'll be supportive for your own personal development. And with this, in terms of what are the qualities of a good doctor? Yes, it's knowing about pathology, of course it is, and about pharmacology and all that, but it's, it's much more exactly for you to have that person-centered uh, approach. And there is a comprehensive support services um, that KMMS has from both universities and from within the school also that hopefully makes the students feel supported from day one. Next slide, please. If you join the KMMS com community, how does this look for you? You'll be our sixth cohort of students. Um, and for someone that, that was here in the first, it, it, it's a dream to say this, honestly. Uh, the picture you, you see there is our current year, year ones. Um, I absolutely adore when this, when this diagram is made and I, I, I usually show them um, the first time. And I, I think it's, it's great to see this, this picture and see all of them in their first um, week at KMMS. Um, and that can be exactly you, uh, as our sixth cohort of students, it would start just after we graduate our first cohort, which should be uh, around the summer of 2025. And I can guarantee to you, we're all very anxious and looking forward to, to be there and graduate our first cohort. You'll be joining a community that has international team of academics and professional service staff. Many of uh, our academic staff are clinical academics and they are, work in primary care networks, hospitals, mental health care providers, etc. So there's a really broad range of colleagues that you will contact daily with. Um, and we also have a very active research team um, that I'll, I'll have a couple of slides in the end also to, to speak about that. Next slide, please. So very quickly, the KMMS facilities, um, the, the building you see here on, on the left is the Verena Homes um, building. This is in the Canterbury Christchurch University. It's a building that is shared for several programs, not only KMMS, but it's definitely where, besides other activities, 
anything that's related with anatomy. So on the right, top right, you can see the anatomy learning center where there's dissection that was mentioned in the, in the video also. Um, and on the top bottom, you have our simulation suite and you can see the mannequins there. It's quite an incredible, um, really recent simulation suite. And this is where the students want to learn anatomy on the top, of course. And in the other one, they go there and learn, for instance, clinical procedures, clinical examination. Next slide. And this one is in the University of Kent. This is the Paris building. It's the, the medical school building. And you can see there in the lecture theater, our students. Um, and this is probably what is our current year three at the moment. So it's taken a couple of years ago. Um, and on the bottom, we have a picture of a, a video that was made in the GP simulation suite. We have two small GP um, simulation suites of pairs currently being quite used in our year four, where well, they'll do um, virtual reality, uh, small sessions um, during their year four. Next slide, please. And finally, as I said, uh, KMMS has, uh, besides their, their undergraduate program, which hopefully we'll, we'll have our fifth year starting in, in September and graduating our students next year, um, we also are very proud to say that within a new medical school, we're able to, to build quite um, a very good research, very strong research starting. Our main areas, talk to the main areas that um, we also want to, to explore in our curriculum and are very important, especially um, in the area of Kent, and that's global health, mental health, and coastal and reg regional deprivation. Uh, I'm not going to read all these um, bullet points, but uh, allow you to do so. Um, but I, I would say that that we we got over four pound million uh, for oh sorry over four million pounds in grants um, so far, and you can see there there's been a lot of work in terms of research groups on launch, regional research networks. Um, we, we recruited uh, research research professors for KMMS. Um, and right at the end, you can see a, a relatively recent uh, grant of 1.7 million to explore relationship between sleep and circadian health disturbances, in cycles and depression. So quite a lot going on. And I hope you, you, you can join and see how this research is not only something that is happening alongside the program, something that we embed in the program. A lot of these colleagues are in research are also um, delivering the teaching and then the graduate program. Next slide, please. And this here is just to complement a little bit what it said um, and some projects running. And you can see some pictures on the left in um, some projects around sick community to explore attitudes to mental health. Um, we also have a lot of uh, projects with other uh, partners. You see some examples here in the bullet points to turn their contemporary and um, a couple of weeks ago, we held the Women's Health Inequality Summit, um, launching a new partnership with um, Discovery Park Health Innovation, Ken Surrey and Sussex, and the Integrated Care Board. And this, all of this project is actually to uh, address health inequalities, which again is part of a, also the mission that KMMS wants in terms of addressing health inequalities in your undergraduate program, but also in research. And I believe that is my neck, my last slide. If you if you move, um, yes, thank you. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'm I'm very happy to answer. Thank you for that presentation. We actually do have some questions coming in. So I'm going to start with this first one. You mentioned the KMMS vision and values. How do they impact on the day to day life at KMMS? Oh, um, well, I, I would say that without you noticing, it should impact quite a lot because I'm expecting that, um, you know, if I talk about myself uh, and I go and deliver a lecture, I'll be kind to my students in listening to their feedback and explaining things if I have to 10 times, doesn't matter, is, is, is to, to ensure they understand the, the subject. And I hope to show that I'm passionate at the same time, I hope to to inspire them some curiosity on the theme and to see that curiosity coming from them 
um, uh, so I think it's in the day to day and it's a, a small example. Um, but on the day to day, we expect this, we expect to see this, we expect if we see a, a student struggling that everyone is kind around uh, and is there to support. Um, so I, I think it impacts on the day to day and I hope it's, it's visible uh, to everyone on the day to day. Thank you. Our second question is, what do you think makes KMS stand out from other medical schools? Thank you. I think I've addressed a little bit in in the um, in the slide in terms of more objective things like the the initial the very early on uh, clinical experience and the person centered care, um, which I I think are really incredible values. And we're trying more and more in terms of addressing health inequalities uh, and decolonizing the curriculum. However, I think in a personal level, um, KMMS is, is still at the moment a small community, uh, very approachable. And I think one of the things that I absolutely am proud of in the door is the relation we have with our students. Um, the staff student relationships I'd see at KMMS is, is quite unique and is not seen in, in a lot of places, uh, something we, we really, we work hard to maintain both sides. And I think both sides are very proud of. Thank you. And I know we talked a little bit about values, but what qualities do you want to see in KMMS doctors of the future? Oh, oh that's a difficult one. Um, so many. Um, I, I think in part it is addressing those values. Uh, I want them to, to be kind to the person they will see in front of them. And I want them to not see them only as their patient, but remember that they have a family and or carer or responsibilities and stresses and all that. Um, so I think I think kindness is is one of the main values um, I would like them to to get out of KMMS within that person centeredness that is really at our heart. Um, I'm, I'm not uh, ignoring the knowledge and all that, of course, that's that's all, all there, but I think being kind is very important to me. Yeah, that is very true. Thank you, Dr. Oliveira. Don't forget, all, send all your questions in to YouTube and Facebook live chat if you haven't already. Follow KMMS students and staff to answer later. We've got another presentation shortly, but first, here's a tour of the KMMS Pairs Building. Hello everybody, my name is Joe, I'm a first year medical student. Hi guys, my name is Garima, I'm a first year medical student at Canton Medway Medical School. And this is our wonderful Pairs building. So this is our one of our main social spaces in the Pairs building. So you will find a lot of students here before and after lectures, you know, maybe getting some snacks from the vending machines, maybe from the coffee machine as well. It's a kind of a great space to kind of chill out after some very informative lectures. After our lecture end, we have a reception here. If you have any questions regarding academics, your mental health, we also have a student life and well-being support here. We also have a therapy dog. Her name is Olive. Got some wonderful spaces to study in. I've, I've spent many hours here, some late nights. You know, security comes around every now and again to make sure that everybody's safe and the building's being looked after. But it's a great environment to, to study in and to learn to become a doctor. So what makes this building different is the GP simulation suite. It's the first of its kind in the Kent area and within that you can practice your kind of simulation trainings, your skills, your communication abilities, taking histories. I think being in the GP room would really help me in my learning, especially during our, our OSCEs, especially for uh, communicating with patients, being exposed in that environment. So this is one of our seminar rooms. We have three on this floor and as you can see we have uh, special partition walls which can open up so in essence the three seminar rooms become one massive room but also we can come in here as individuals ourselves or even in, in small groups to use them as for our independent study time. One of the things I personally like to use the seminar rooms for is particularly at the end of the day I'll come in here usually by myself and I'll use the massive whiteboards here to, to write all of the lecture notes down, the notes I made, kind of understand it, process that information. 
This is one of our PC rooms. We have a few of our tutorials here. We also write our exams here. Some of us sit here and actually rewatch a few of our lectures here. You can also have a place to study if you're more of a computer person. Fun fact about some of our PC rooms is they have some standing desks. So particularly when you're studying for long periods of time, for at least me, I like to kind of sometimes get up, stand around, and kind of work in a bit that way. So you have that option here as well. Now, I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Joel Pett, who can tell us more about the KMMS curriculum and assessments. Hi, Daisy. Um, thank you for inviting me to talk about the curriculum today. Really excited to talk to you about our innovative curriculum here at KMMS. Um, so to introduce myself, my name is Joel Petch. I'm a senior lecturer in the medical school. I'm also the academic lead for year two, and I'm also lucky enough to lead the year two module, uh, Neuroscience and Behaviour. And we can talk about that as we progress through the presentation. So if we could please have the first slide. Thank you. So um, we can see on this image, this is an image that's also on our website, should you wish to explore it in a little bit more detail. So this demonstrates the five year program in a nice, easy to digest um, illustration. So we have years one to five running, um, ru running down and we can see that we'd have the modules within any given year running horizontally. Now there's a couple of things to note here. And that is that as a rough rule of thumb, Years one and two, 80% of the, the student-based act, student activity will be on campus and around about 20% would be in general practice. And for years three, four and five, there's a, there's a bit of a switch here where again, there's an approximation around about 80% of student activity will be in clinical practice in our acute hospital trusts um, and 20% either on campus or with university-based teaching, but some of that may well be online. There's a couple of take homes here. Um, firstly, is that we are offering an integrated curriculum. So this is an integrated curriculum in so much as we have very early clinical exposure. So within the first term of year one, students have the opportunity to engage in clinical practice. And this takes the form of what we refer to as immersion weeks. So these are week long packages where an individual would be allocated a primary care network and they'll work alongside a GP. So we have this early clinical exposure. One of the other things to note is that we offer a spiral curriculum. So this is where the foundation of knowledge that's built early in the program in year one is acknowledged and built upon in year two, and that in turn is acknowledged and built upon in year three. So we're layering the levels of knowledge as we move through the program. If we look at year one in particular, because I'm sure this is what you really want to, to hear about in the first instance as potential applicants, we can see that this broken down in the image into six individual modules. Now, these individual modules um, are either year long modules or they're most or, or termly modules. Mostly there is there is some exception, but it's mostly termly modules. So we can see there are six modules in year one and six modules in year two. Now, broadly, the structure mirror one another from year one and two, but the content clearly is, is different. So we have these um, long and thin year long modules, including community and primary care in practice, one and two, which denotes years one and two. And this is the opportunity we have to work alongside our GP colleagues in clinical practice within GP. And there are six weeks within year one and six weeks within year two where individuals can shadow and work alongside GPs um, in clinical practice. So we're really proud and pleased that we can offer that early clinical exposure. In addition to that, we also have uh, another year long module that's professional development and person centered practice. Um, and as Dr. Oliveira had stated, this is one of the things we're really very keen to impress here in terms of the, the kindness and the person centered nature um, of the healthcare, that we want people to be expert clinicians for the next 50 years in the NHS. Uh, and within that, we, we want people to move away from the historical notion of patienthood and really embrace um, personhood and how we work with people and their families to support them um, in the context of their health and healthcare needs. There is one other um, year long module to note, this is the skills for clinical practice. Um, and the reason this, the reason this is um, 
uh, is a year one, no, sorry, excuse me. The reason this is a year long module is because the content would um, supplement the teaching that's occurring within the, the shorter, the shorter, sharper system based modules. So, for example, if we are looking at the heart, lungs and blood, and this would run termly, um, it, you would have the, the generic anatomy, physiology, biochemistry of the heart, lungs and blood within the module. But then we'd look at developing the skills or in the skills module. And it could be something along the lines of looking at how do we take a respiratory history or how do we take a cardiovascular history? Or it could be how do we take a cardiovascular examination? Um, in addition to that, we would also have crosstalk and interplay between this module and the other year long modules, so professional development and person centered practice. So how can we work with somebody who might be experiencing heart failure, so to speak? And this would be reflected too in, in the context of the discussions and the themes that are being explored within uh, community and primary care and practice. So even though they are self limited individual modules, there's great cross talk between them, which further enhances the, the integrated um, nature of our curriculum. So of the three short termly based modules in year one, we have Foundations for Health and Disease, which is um, a welcome to healthcare, welcome to anatomy and physiology, and we'll look at the major bodily systems. Um, and that takes us from September through to the Christmas break. Following the Christmas break, students will engage in heart, lungs and blood, and that will take us through to the Easter break. And then in the summer term, students will engage with the nutrition, metabolism and excretion module. Um, and following the successful con conclusion of the assessments, um, students will progress into year two, where we'd have a very similar approach. Again, we have these three um, long year long modules, but we also have the three termly modules. Um, and the three termly modules in year two are neuroscience and behavior, reproduction and endocrinology, which our year two students have just completed the assessment for, and then after the Easter break, they'll return to look at the musculoskeletal and immune system modules. So we can see that the structure between years one and two are very similar. As I stated, 80% of this time is based on campus and 20% in practice. And in the context of years one and two, it's general practice. Um, there is an option within year two also to have an early um, exposure to urgent care. So we have one day in urgent care that's embedded into the community and primary care in practice two module also. And then there's a real shift from years three to three, four and five onwards, where rather than having 80% of your time in university on campus, 80% of the time is now spent within the acute hospital trusts. Um, we have several hospital trusts in Kent and Medway and students will be allocated to trust and they'll work within that trust and they'll, they'll run through the clinical modules whilst remaining part of the medical school and having regular check-ins and regular support and regular teaching on on campus also so so there are some additional opportunities here as well we have opportunity for intercalated degrees specifically between years four and five and i have a slide on that coming up shortly um, i understand this is a lot of information here so this is a a basic outline of the course structure that, um, that we offer here at KMS, but the take home messages are that it's an integrated program. We have early clinical exposure. We have a spiral curriculum. So when you learn about the nervous system and in, in foundations of health and disease, you'll build upon that in neuroscience and behavior. You'll be able to apply that in psychiatry in year three, and you'll be able to apply it further still in neurology in year four, and then apply it further still in your senior rotations in year five. So we're always looking to build upon your previously acquired knowledge. Um, if we could please have the next slide. So when you look what we'll learn at KMMS, we can break our teaching down into specific themes. Um, and these are the themes that we that are integral to the program we offer. So we start with anatomy. Um, we are really pleased that we can offer full cataract dissection, um, mostly within years one and two of the program, this very early exposure to cataract dissection and as Dr. Oliveira had stated we're very lucky um, to have a state-of-the-art anatomy learning center and a state-of-the-art dissection room within that so we're really pleased that we have these facilities which really do lend themselves to um, being able to engage with these topics. We also have a theme looking at biomedicine so essentially cellular medicine 
um, and also physiology. So this is a really important theme in terms of how organs and organ systems work in synchronicity to undertake a task. Of course, as you would expect, there is teaching regarding pathology, so the signs and symptoms and how disorders, conditions, syndromes and disease manifest. And then, of course, we'd also look at pharmacology and therapeutics. So we've identified that somebody has a type of illness. So now we need to learn in terms of what medicines, what interventions, what therapies can assist to, to improve somebody's quality of life and to treat the illness which you've identified. We also have themes looking at person and population health. So looking at epidemiology, so in terms of why and how specific um, disorders or illnesses might manifest and they may, may well be culturally or socially driven. So we're very, we have, um, we, we try to look at the social determinants of health through, through many of the things that we, that we explore. We also have a theme looking at scholarship and scientific inquiry. So we want our medical doctors to be scientifically literate. We want you to be able to examine the best evidence base, draw these salient conclusions. And also we want to stimulate these curious and innovative minds. And we do that by a quite robust teaching related to scholarship and scientific inquiry. Alongside all of this, we look at our professional and clinical skills. So it becomes part and parcel of being a healthcare professional, of being a medical doctor, is that the clinical skills would come into this. And we can broadly look at this in two domain, in one of two domains. The first may be looking at communication skills, how we engage with people, how we build a rapport, and how we elicit this core information that we need within consultation. But also then we've got the procedural skills. So we may well be doing these things simultaneously. So we're looking at exploring someone's psychiatric history whilst undertaking a mental state examination, so to speak. And of course, underpinning much of this, we've got medical ethics and law. Um, we are in a privileged position and we, are, we need to work within the, within the um, best practice in terms of ethical practice. And of course, we need to work within the law. So you need to know the law related to um, your chosen profession. We've also got another theme looking at human behaviour. So in terms of why people do the things they do um, and when they do it. Um, and we really like to draw this together into vignettes that we can look at through a biopsychosocial lens. So we can look at things through a biological perspective, a psychological perspective, and a social perspective. And that helps us to develop a rounded understanding in terms of what might be going on with, a, with an individual and how best we can help them. So that's, they're the core areas that we'll learn about within the, the undergraduate curriculum. There's opportunity to look at some aspects in greater detail as well, in some, in some more depth. And these are mostly topics which align to the core program and support and supplement the core program. And this includes our selected student components, the individual research um, project, and these represent a level of optionality within the program, and also the option for intercalated degrees um, for of which we have funded opportunities. Now, I do have a slide looking at these, this op these optionalities, um, these options also, um, so I can talk about student selective components um, when we get there. But if we could please move to the next slide. Thank you. So in terms of should you wish to apply for KMS, and I very much hope that you do, um, this would be a, a, an outline of the timetable that you would expect um, from year one, term one. As you can see, we will have multiple modules running simultaneously. This is because we would have these three year long modules that run um, throughout the course of the year, whilst also looking at the, the termly system based modules at the same time. So there's an expectation for people to engage with multiple modules at the same time, regardless of where the assessment is within the year. So when you, when we welcome you, we always offer a welcome week. We recognize that moving to a university, starting a new program, moving away from the family home, moving might be your first time moving out. These can be stressful events for people. So we want to give you the warmest welcome here. Um, we would generally have a, a nice big welcome barbecue where we can get to, to, to know you and welcome you to KMS formally. And then we have a, a set structure over the course of a week where we really want to familiarize yourself, familiarize you and orientate you to, to KMS. Um, as I state, you'll be engaging in multiple modules simultaneously. So 
the professional development person-centered practice, we might start to look at medical ethics, a bit of self-awareness uh, from the outset, skills for clinical practice in terms of, again, developing self-awareness or how best we should be speaking to people with some professionalism. And then in terms of foundations of health and disease, we start looking at the major bodily systems. Another system um, is, is a good example. Um, one of the things we're really, really proud of is this very early clinical exposure. So the first of these um, placement weeks, I will refer to as immersion weeks, occurs in early November. So you started in September. By November, you're getting ready to go into practice. Of course, again, this can be another thing that can be quite daunting for people, quite anxiety provoking. So we do have sessions related to preparation for practice to make sure you're absolutely prepared for um, entering clinical practice for the first time. And when you are entering practice, it's important to note that you are there to work with, but to shadow um, a registered professional. So um, in a fully supportive and supervised manner. So please don't um, think that we're over asking too much too soon. Um, throughout the course of both year one and year two, we have two immersion weeks um, per term. So in the first term, the second and the third term. So they're evenly spread throughout the course of the year. And you will be going to that same um, GP practice within year one, and then we'll offer you a, a, an alternative practice um, within year two. So hopefully you're starting to develop the flavor that these are busy programs. Um, the ask is um, that you do attend, that you engage, that you communicate with us. Um, and once we get to the end of the term, we'll have our first assessment, which would be the assessment related to foundations of health and disease, your first examination. Um, and once that as assessment has been sat, um, hopefully you can go and enjoy your holidays and put your feet up and, and read some, some, uh, something that's non-medical related, because we recognize it's really important that it's important you engage in the program, but it's equally important that you manage to have an opportunity to reflect and rest as well. So we've got these holidays that are built into the program. If I could please have the next slide. So if we look at some of the activities we undertake to um, promote learning, we have lots of different approaches. We recognize that lots of different approaches would be really helpful because it depends upon the, the content that we're learning. So some of the commonly used methods of teaching include team-based learning activities. These are where we would have um, students allocated to a small group of perhaps eight students. And we try to make this as diverse as possible. The mix, the mix of um, graduate students versus school leavers, ages and genders. Um, and within this, this is about consolidating um, previous learning activities. So for example, um, I can give an example from the module which I lead in year two, where we have a team-based learning activity looking at the impact of stress and drugs upon sleep. And this will specifically explore the learning in some of the lectures. So the lectures being the physiology of sleep, addiction tolerance dependence, and the human stress axis, so, and how we respond to stress. So we'll look at the learning from those three lectures. We'll ask students to work in a small group um, within team-based learning. And we'll start off by undertaking a, a, an individual quiz. Students will work individually to test themselves to see what knowledge they can recall from those lectures. We'll then ask you to work within your group to go through the quiz. And it's about coming to a shared consensus of, I think this is answer A, and these are the reasons why. And this is where the teamwork element comes in, because as a team, you have to have agreement to what you think the correct answer is. And once that's done, we then get to apply this newly acquired, this newly consolidated knowledge to a clinical scenario. So we might have a clinical scenario of somebody who's perhaps experiencing high levels of stress and might be utilizing drugs because they think that it helps their sleep, but it helps in one way, but it's it's not helpful in the longer term. So we can get we can get to, um, we can really explore some of these clinical cases in that respect. Uh, we have team based learning activities um, quite heavily for years one and two. Um, and there, there are activities which are that students um, that are praised very highly. We also have case-based learning. So case-based learning, case-based discussions. And this is where an individual will be asked to talk for a clinical presentation. The signs, the symptoms, the history, the support, the interventions, what's worked, what hasn't worked. And this could be as an individual or as a small group. 
We have interprofessional learning activities. Um, just last week, our year one students um, had an interprofessional learning activity with the Medway School of Pharmacy, recognizing that we, we need to develop relationships and ways of working with other professions from the outset. So we're really pleased that we can offer these interprofessional learning activities. We employ a flipped classroom approach also, where we will be asking you to engage with a set of resources before coming into the classroom. And once we're in the classroom, we can reflect upon it, we can interrogate the evidence, we can look at um, some of the things that we might find surprising, and we might be able to apply these to a clinical case as well. So we use flipped classroom quite a lot. These are within the context of flipped classrooms, it's, it's imperative that people undertake any pre-reading, and we offer um, a list of pre-reading activities the week before, so there's plenty of time to, to be involved in this. We have a blended approach. So we have some, some online learning and we have some face-to-face -face learning. So there is a mixture there recognizing that people need to develop skills of learning in different ways. So we, we offer that from the outset. And one of the biggest things is recognizing that our cohorts, both within the cohort and um, subsequent cohorts can offer a great level of support for one another. So we're huge fans of peer assisted learning whether this be two people sitting down and talking about cardiovascular examination or whether this could be speaking to uh, some more senior students in terms of well actually how did you navigate managing workloads and differing um, and competing um, demands simultaneously so we have we're really pleased that we have the network of students that we have here um, and as, as Dr. Oliveira stated, there is um, a sense of collegiality here, and that's something that we're really, really proud of. So it's something that we, we seek to use um, absolutely. In addition to that, we also have um, traditional lectures. We have small group learning. We undertake full cadaveric dissection um, within the Anatomy Learning Center. We also recognize that some topics require a more discursive approach. So, for example, if we're looking at some of the ethics topics, um, we might we would offer a lecture looking at the core components, but then we would ask students to break into small groups and we'll have a discussion about this, recognizing that some there's a sensitivity for some topics that perhaps are best facilitated via a discussion as opposed to a lecture. We have a high emphasis also on high quality, high volume of simulated practice. And again, we're very lucky to have a state of the art, high fidelity simulation suite um, that we have access to and our students spend a lot of time in the simulation suite. And this again is looking at developing those clinical skills. Again, this could be communication skills or it could be procedural skills. So cranial nerve examination, for example. Um, we have some e-modules that we'd ask students to engage with as well. Um, and as I stated, we have these immersion weeks, these clinical practice um, elements and this is from the November of year one so these are um, these are interspersed frequently throughout years one and two and of course there, there has to be an element of self-directed work um, within this this is a, a busy program um, and so the expectation is that people would undertake a level of self-directed work as well to best prepare and to best engage with with these activities if we could please have the next slide. Thank you. So in terms of um, what we'll learn, so from the outset, within the first month, we undertake, um, we offer a mixture of both um, hands-on and theoretical teaching. So within the first month, you'll be introduced to our high fidelity simulation suite, and you will learn some of these key um, clinical skills. So checking vital signs, CPR, infection control. And this is absolutely from the outset, from within term one. Um, we're really pleased to have these facilities and also in terms of the level of support we offer within this. Uh, next slide, please. So within the first month, you'll also engage with a set of lectures and tutorials. Um, and these would be lectures associated to the foundations of health and disease. Tutorials may well be within the professional development person-centered practice module, um, but we could also have lectures in the context of our skills module. There will be seminars from the outset as well, 
and team-based learning, uh, this process I spoke through, which includes individual quizzes, team quizzes, and then the application of knowledge to a clinical scenario from the outset. Um, so all of these were in, in the first um, month of the program. Next slide, please. Also, within this first month, we will have introduced you to the Anatomy Learning Centre. Um, we'll safely teach you how to mount and dismount a scalpel, um, and we'll start with dissection of the chest wall um, from within the first month. So we can see that there's a very early focus upon clinical skills, on cadaveric dissection, uh, preparation for practice, as well as the eventual um, moving into practice within the CPCP1 module. Uh, next slide, please. This is um, a rather busy slide, but the reason we choose to show this is because it illustrates that this is a busy program. Um, in this image, we can see that um, the the tiles that are green relate to the professional development person-centered practice module. Those that are blue relate to the foundations of health and disease module. Those that are this kind of off orange color relate to um, skills. And then we've also got the uh, CPCP one, the community and primary care in practice one in terms of introduction to placements. And then we've also got some additional workshops that sits outside of any individual module, but it's absolutely critical for you to understand the process of KMS and to prevent any downstream confusion. And in this case, there's an applied knowledge test workshop outlining how we undertake assessments here at KMS. Now, there might be some slight differences to this when you come to join us here at KMS, hopefully, um, but it's, it, the principles remain the same in terms of it's a busy program. It's best to think of the program as akin to a job that's nine to five. Um, it, is, it is busy. The expectations are that you attend and you engage um, and we'll work with you with everything else. Um, if we could please change the slide. So we have some, um, these are mostly verbatim quotes here from, from existing students. Um, and, and staff also. So when we look at how intense this program is, um, as I stated, if we think of it as a nine to five job, um, we will find that there are some weeks that are slightly lighter than others. Um, but within that, there, of course, the, counter the, the counterpoint is that some weeks might be more intense than others. Um, we will find that um, Within the peaks and troughs of this, we would generally try to give you some opportunity to have um, fewer teaching sessions immediately prior to assessments. So there is a revision period. But we can't escape the fact that it's a busy program. So in the context of year one, we have 653 compulsory face-to-face -face learning hours within the academic year. So if we think of that, that's considerably more than most other um, undergraduate programs. And this is in the context of an academic program where the academic year is slightly longer than many other undergraduate programs, although having that slightly longer um, academic year is, is, um, is common in many of the healthcare programs. Now, as I say, it's nine to five, think about a nine to five. However, we do mostly keep um, Wednesday afternoons available for you. Um, there's lots of sports events, um, lots of societies, lots of clubs happening on a Wednesday afternoon. So we do try to give you that time, um, certainly in years one and two. And we recognize that this is, there's an important element of socialization here, particularly when you're new to a university. Um, and of course, we, we absolutely advocate um, the physical exercise and the collegiality that comes with this. We also recognize that some students do need to um, have paid employment. Um, as they move through the program. Um, and it is possible, it is possible, but when we speak to students that are balancing these um, competing demands in terms of one of the most academically intense programs that there is, as well as um, paid employment, um, it can be a constant juggling act. And what we don't want to do is lose perspective. Um, yes, people may need um, paid employment, but actually the paid employment is to ensure that you can engage in the program 
Um, so we need to maintain that balance and that will be different for everybody. Um, there are support available for students should they find themselves in um, extreme unexpected financial hardship via our student support service. So should that happen, we, we would hope that students would come and talk to us about their difficulties um, as opposed to neglecting their studies. As I stated, the, te the terms tend to be slightly longer than parent universities, um, and that can impact upon some society activities. Um, and of course, with, with in the context of that, the, the holidays um, are slightly shorter as well. So that may impact on the ability to um, earn some, some financial, um, to undertake financial employment. Within the context of years three to five, this is where you move into the acute hospitals where we have 80% of the teaching happening in a hospital setting um, or associated community settings. There is also an expectation for some out of hours placement activity, and that includes both nights and weekends. Um, so, so please do bear that in mind. That is an expectation in years three to five. You could please change the slide. In terms of our placements, our practice weeks, they start in the November of, of year one, really early clinical exposure. Within these, they, they would be the aspect within clinical practice, within GP, but what's also really important that we bring you back into the campus afterwards and we, we reflect upon this in terms of the experience, the emotions that this evoked, what went well, what didn't go so well, what are the pressures within within primary care. So we also build in these reflective workshops. And this again would focus around the, the themes that are being explored. So for example, in year two, when you're learning about psychiatric conditions, the themes may well be memory loss or low mood. In years one and two, these primary care net networks are placed across Kent and Medway. We would offer a different PCN in year two compared to the one that you went to in year one because we want to give you a range of experiences. As you um, progress through the program, there is more independent learning within, um, within a clinical setting, um, and, and that includes when you return to general practice within year four of the program. And then as I stated from years three, four, and five, we have these longitudinal placements in the um, acute trusts across Hendon, Kent and Medway. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of some of the innovative collaborations that we undertake here, um, we're really pleased to be offering these. We've forged very good links with very many local organizations, whether these be private, voluntary, independent, or, um, NH or NHS. So there's some examples here. Um, the image at the top of the screen relates to a, an intellectual or a learning disability workshop. And this is a workshop which is co-developed co and co-delivered with our co-educators who are people that um, have a learning disability and they'll come and talk about their experience of healthcare, what went well, what didn't go so well, and what we can do as academics and clinicians to improve healthcare provision for this cohort of people. Now, this workshop is delivered in partnership also with the Tizard Centre at the University of Kent as one of the um, international centres of excellence for the study of learning disabilities and autism. We've also got the, um, the various uh, other activities, and there's an image here related to our year two students. And this is where we had an immersive experience looking at sensory impairment and sensory loss with High Kent and the Kent branch of the Royal National Institute for the Blind, looking at how best we can um, work with people that have either hearing loss or sight loss. Um, so we're really pleased that we can offer these immersive experiences as, as well as drawing in people with lived experience because it offers a level of authenticity that um, surpasses what you would get from your standard lecture. Uh, next slide, please. So I've mentioned briefly about the level of optionality within the program. And so there's some examples in here. here. In years one and two, we have our student selective components. This consists of six um, mornings within year one and eight within year two. And from a menu of different activities, students will be asked 
to rank their preferences. And we try our very best to give you your absolute preference um, within the context of, of this. Um, and some of these um, student selective components or SSCs include um, dissection, including forensic um, pathology, robotic surgery, the identification and management of delirium or acute confusional state, wilderness medicine, looking at polar medicine, and war zones medicine, um, intensive therapy, you know, or ITU um, medicine and accident emergency also. And we've got some images here. So the image on, at the top are some of our students last year, a year two students on a visit to one of the local ITU units. And we've also got an image of um, some of our SSC students who are undertaking forensic pathology um, in the simulated suite and looking at some blood splatter analysis as well. Um, and then if, as we move into years three and four, with there is some further optionality here in terms of the individual research projects. These are large pieces of work. We're within the year three of the program. There'll be a scoping exercise where students would look at a designated topic and then they'll write a research proposal. And then in year four of the program, there'll be time allocated in which an individual can undertake their research. So when we come back to wanting to develop people who happen to be excellent doctors, but are also scientifically literate, um, these are the skills that we're developing within the program here. Um, and we can see there's an example of this in the, the bottom image where one of our year four students has generated um, an assessment tool looking at how we can grade the diversification or the diversity within teaching materials. So it's a really good tangible outcome on the basis of this work. Other examples include clinical audits, historical reviews, scoping reviews, systematic reviews, and they can be dry projects um, such as such as literature reviews or wet projects where students are going into the lab laboratory to undertake a specific piece of work. Um, and of course, these are undertaken um, under the supervision of a project supervisor as well. Uh, next slide, please. OK, this is the last slide from me. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about assessment at KMS. And we recognize that there is no one standard way of assessing somebody. So we employ a range of different assessment methodologies. One of the things that we'll see in, um, as most common, is the applied knowledge test. So our applied knowledge tests um, come to at the end of our system-based modules. Um, and they are a mixture of either um, single best answer, so very similar to, to multiple choice questions, um, or very short answer questions where there is no visual prompt. You'll have a, a scenario, a question, and then you would need to provide the answer. There are also student presentations which um, are assessed, and there are clinical skills assessments also. Our OSCEs are objective structured clinical examinations. We also assess via essay, project report, and the e-portfolio that looks at things such as attendance and engagement and professionalism, because we're really strong. We're really clear that people should be living the values and acting in a professional manner from the outset. We do offer formative assessment opportunities to help you prepare. We very, very strongly recommend that you take this opportunity to put a, a draft or a formative assessment in so that you can gain this really important feedback to really maximize the summative assessment. One of the things we do here at KMS is we promote excellent. We want excellent clinicians. We want to develop excellent people to be excellent doctors, but we assess to the level of safety and competence. So we want excellent, but we must, must, must ensure safety and competence. And this is the, the level um, that we assess to. In terms of um, our applied knowledge tests, we have in-year resets. So should somebody not pass one of the tests the assessments are the first opportunity. There is a reset for the system-based modules. Um, in terms of the OSCEs and the AKTs, this is sequential testing. So there are no resets. So sequential testing means we would have a large data set based on um, the, the first sit, the first sequence. And if a student has done exceedingly well, we will say, thank you very much for your time. You're very welcome to go. You do not need to come back to the, the second element. However, if a student is borderline or hasn't done so well, we would invite them back to the second sequence where we'd undertake further assessment to gather as much data as we can in terms of assessment. 
Because of this, there is no traditional reset assessments. We also look at assessment for fundamental tracks, and those fundamental tracks include the anatomy, the biomedicine, the physiology, and pathology that I spoke about earlier. And then the very last comment for me is as, as of um, as of next year, the General Medical Council introduces the MLA, the Medical Licensing Assessment, which is a standardized national assessment, and it's to this which we're benchmarking. So all of the assessments that we undertake is a lot of about having alignment for the MLA so that we can put people in the best possible place to, to be successful in this national um, external examination. Um, and I believe that's it from me. That's my last slide. It's been really lovely to speak to you. Um, and I, I hope that you found this interesting. Um, and I'm happy to hand back to Daisy. Thank you for showing us more about the curriculum. We have had a couple of questions go through, so I'm going to start with this one. Why do UK MMS students start placements so early in the course? So we, we're really pleased that we can offer this because we recognise that the, the th applying theory to practice is a really difficult thing to do. So we want to offer people experience of clinical practice from the outset. It offers a level of authenticity um, because it also demonstrates, a, it can promote a level of reflection. So you go into clinical practice, you, you have this experience, you can come back, you can reflect upon it. What does it say about practice? What does it say about me? What can I do differently? So if someone has what they perceive to be a difficult experience with somebody, actually, or does it say more about the person I was talking to? Or does it say more about me? How could I approach that differently? So there's a level of um, personal growth within this. And also, it offers the opportunity to apply your knowledge to a real life setting, which offers a level of authenticity from a really early point within the programme. Thank you. And we just have a second question. Um, when do you start to use cavities in year one? So we, we use um, cadaveric material. So um, from, from the outset, um, I stated that we're undertaking um, dissection of the chest wall from um, from within the first month, and that is something that we undertake, we offer here. So it's full cadaveric dissection from the outset. Now, after this short film on a day in the life of a KMS student, we'll hear more about student life at KMS and actually meet some students as well. My name's Sunny, I'm a second year medical student. Come join me for a day in the life at KMMS. Starting the day with some housemate etiquette, which is essential. Wash your dishes, guys. It's 9 a.m. and we're off to campus. Today, I've got a presentation for our student selected component. Mine was about sleep and the importance of sleep hygiene. Smash the presentation. It's now 12 and we're off to the gym for a workout. I'm currently running a full body split, but focusing on pull-ups and dips. I'm making sure to get in some leg movements as well but majority of my leg workout is through running recently. I'm a big fan of the wall art in my gym. With the workout done now, it's time to head home and grab some lunch before going back to pairs and getting some studying done. Exams are fast approaching, and in this module, we're studying the reproductive system as well as endocrinology. Between my study blocks, I've got a couple of tutoring lessons as well. But after that, I get back to studying, and then it's time to call it a day. And the last thing I did today was play in the five-a-side league with my classmates. This is always a highlight of the week. It's so enjoyable. Here are some celebratory poses from Billy as we actually managed to win this game. Make sure to hit like and follow if you want to see more. Good morning everyone and welcome to a day in my life as a first year KMMS medical student. Today's going to be a little bit different, you'll see what I mean. Start my day off with breakfast, delicious, walked past the cathedral which was gorgeous as per usual. Today we were on Christchurch campus because we had to have dissection in this morning, so there's me in my lab coat and then after that coffee break. Then we had a group learning session on dyslipidemia which was a couple of our lectures yesterday were based on. And then we had lunch and a little study break and I did meal prep my lunch but then I was really hungry and forgot to film it so that's my empty box. Then I 
had a choir practice and then it was back for another two lectures, one on applied anatomy and another one on the cardiac pressure volume loop. And then Laura came and picked me up to take me to the venue because tonight was the halfway ball for all of our year threes who are halfway to being doctors. So we got the venue ready, got ready ourselves. There's my gorgeous table. Food was delicious. We had awards, prizes, all sorts. Um, changing into my Crocs, obviously, because I had to have a little boogie. Um, and then taxi home and hot water bottle and bed. Bye, guys. Now, I'm pleased to be joined by KMMS Academic Lead for Student Life and Wellbeing, Dr. Julia Hines. Let's hear from Dr. Hines about student life and wellbeing about at KMMS. Hello and welcome. So we look at uh, student life and wellbeing in its entirety. We'll give you a whistle stop tour. And it's a very important area because if you're not well, if you don't take care of your health, then you won't perform uh, to your optimum in your studies. So if we can begin with slide one, please. So we are here to help you and support you in your day-to-day -day, uh, life. And you can drop in to Student Life and Wellbeing uh, with regards to your concerns and inquiries at KMMS we are there to signpost you and if you need specialist referrals uh, such as to counselling or mental health service we can do that for you also we can also advise you on finance on housing and if you have a, a physical or a mental health impairment we can create a, what's called an inclusive learning plan and this means that it would put you on an equal platform to a student who does not have such an impairment. We can also offer you advice on academic and study skills. And there are many wellbeing activities and other support events uh, within both universities. So you will have access to those universities uh, events both at University of Kent and Christchurch University and also then within the medical school. So we are in all a friendly face and a listening ear. And I'd like you to meet uh, our most important member of staff, Olive. Olive's a Sprocker Spaniel and she's our pet therapy dog. So you can actually book an appointment if you like dogs, if you think they bring down your stress levels. Olive has been trained in this fashion. She belongs to Jo, her human, who is a psychiatrist and Jo would use Olive in, for example, her clinic when she's having breaking bad news sessions. Next slide, please. So we offer accommodation on campus. As you know, we have two campuses. We have the University of Kent, and you can see on your screen, the University of Kent consists of, for example, Parkwood Flat or Parkwood House and other accommodation and then we also have um, accommodation on Canterbury Christchurch and an example of that would be at Petros Court then on the other side of your screen. So you can live on campus if you wish, uh, you can also be in uh, private rented accommodation within Canterbury. Canterbury is a very small um, little time for um, a city and it is very student friendly so it's made up of um, mostly students and it's multicultural. Next slide please. 
So one of the things that will either take pressure from you or add pressure to you and then subsequently have an impact on your studies is the part of well-being with regards finances. So it's very important that you finance uh, well and budget before you come to medical school for your student life. Um, please consider this. Um, uh, can you afford the course before you start in September? And due to the intensity of the course, it's not easy at times to have a job working alongside your um, studies, especially when you go into your rotations or clinical rotations in year three to five. So we would ask you to consider your living expenses, including accommodation, fees, rent, food, travel, socialising, etc. And then the upfront placement expenses you would need, the tuition fees or um, 9,250 per year for a home student. And if you are a graduate, uh, it's very important to understand that you actually would not be entitled to a tuition fee loan from student finance. There may be other um, uh, pots of funding that you could attain, but it's very important to have this mapped out before you come to medical school. And you can visit this uh, our guidance on our website at the um, site address listed on the page currently at the bottom. Next slide, please. So as we said, we're under both universities. Um, and so you will have access to two student unions in effect, Kent Union and Christchurch Student Union. Um, you can um, offer representation from the medical school and from yourselves. There are elected officers, course reps, and there you'll also find advice and support, volunteering services, sports clubs and societies. In fact, there are over 200 uh, to choose from. So um, whatever your interest and your hobbies, I'm sure you'll um, find something where you will feel at home. So there are also events scheduled throughout the year and it means that you can build up um, your student community. It's very important to have a, a network of um, friends and, and colleagues and peers. And it means that um, you will have uh, support through your friends, support through your colleagues, and you'll be able to compare notes on how um, things are going at the medical school for you. And it's always good to reach out if you need then extra support in the form of professional help. Next slide, please. So we do have a MedSoc a Medical School Society currently. Bradley is our MedSoc president. And MedSoc does have an active role in supporting students to voice their opinions and feedback to the medical school. This indeed forms part of an ongoing dialogue between students and faculty, and that is to provide the best opportunity for our students for um, to succeed um, yourselves, if you're going to be our future students to succeed. And also continuously, uh, um, we, we would seek to improve the student experience. So you have a lot of voice, a lot of say in the medical school, and that will come through in um, subcommittees where we have representatives for each year and also through MedSoc and also through the Student Life and um, Liaison Committee, Student Staff Liaison Committee. Next slide, please. So this is another um, dip into MedSoc. Uh, there has been a lot of activities in the past. There will be a lot in the future. We have some pictures of our students here. Um, you can see some sports activities and then um, the midway ball. And so it is, um, we, we would encourage you to join um, uh, various societies. 
So you can join us for an insightful guest speaker session where experienced clinicians and researchers share their knowledge and experience and engage in workshops designed to enhance your skills and deepen your understanding of medical practice. Our events range from um, the formal galas to sports competitions, providing opportunities to unwind and socialising with fellow students. The MedSoc uh, sub-societies also include, include uh, cardiovascular group, surgery, military medicine, general practice, a &E, obstetrics and gynaecology, and many more. And they also organize expert uh, speakers. So whatever you're interested in, um, you can have a say in how that develops as a student at KMMS. Next slide, please. Um, so this um, is the, the beginning of our next presentation. And that slide will be for um, my colleague um, coming in um, for uh, the admissions process. So we'll break there and we'll go back and ask some questions. Now joined by some of our students, Zeynep and Hannah. We have some questions for our students. So what was your route into KMMS? Hannah, I'm going to start with you. I went straight from school, straight from secondary school, did my A-levels. I can't lie, I applied. I didn't really think I'd get in first time, but it happened. So yeah, I just went straight from school and then, um, then we came into COVID, but um, yeah, it worked out. Yes, Zeynep, how did you get into KMMS? Um, so I'm postgrad. I um, did a psychology degree before this and then I took a gap year to save some money since we don't get um, the tuition fee loan. And then I applied during that gap year and made it in somehow, which I don't think I would, but yeah, I've made it in. Great, thank you. We are having some questions come over the line as well. So I've just got one here. So do students tend to have a favourite module in year one? They said that they're quite interested in heart, lung and blood. They sound that sounds really interesting. Uh, Zainab, I'll start with you. Did you have a favourite module in year one or just overall? Definitely HLB um, in first year. I think overall it was NSP, um, not because it was... Um... <laughs> Dr. Joel Petcher's um, module, but it was, um, I think that was my favourite, definitely. Um, and in first year, it was HLB. Um, those were my favourite, but of course, it changes between everyone. Hannah, if it changes between everyone, did you have a different one or was it the same? For me, I really did enjoy HLB. Brilliant lecturers. And I liked the fact that it's a system, a closed system, the lungs and the heart. It's a, it's a pump and it all made sense. So. That was quite nice. And then in year two, I quite enjoyed the endocrinology and the reproductive sort of thing. And um, again, the system, once you kind of crack it, it makes sense in terms of how the hormones affect one thing and a knock on effect. So that was quite cool. And then obviously now I'm in year four. So uh, seeing it in clinical practice, it, you just put everything together, which is really satisfying. Mm. Yeah, I bet it's nice seeing that journey and now you're getting to see it. Thank you both. Um, our students will be back again for the final Q&A, so please make sure you send any questions in you have for them. Now it's time to watch a short video with our current fa students' favourite things about the course and the campus. So we used to dabble into team-based learning and seminars and lectures and together that formed a great curriculum. In our preclinical years we looked at different systems in the body which shaped the way to fix things up in the clinical placement and thankfully we have really early exposure to these clinical placements right from the get-go. I think the course is really interesting. I love being able to go into a lecture, have a really complex system to kind of learn and understand at the beginning not really getting it but with the help of the lecturer and my classmates being able to understand and explain the process and getting it in the end is really satisfying. I like how practical it is and how with all the theory that we're learning we get to apply it quite early on as well as stuff like clinical skills that really just sort of help consolidate knowledge. I 
I love Canterbury because it's a really beautiful historic city and there's loads of free rinks for example Bell Merlin. However, because it's so peaceful, there's always time that you can get your head down and get on with your work. I think the community here is really open and really inclusive and it just makes you feel like more social. I like that we're part of two universities because it means that you can join societies from both. So I am part of the Music Society at the University of Kent and also Canterbury. So I do music and choirs and stuff with them both, which I really enjoy. One of my favourite things to do in Canterbury is go climbing. There's a really nice rock climbing or bouldering centre down in town and going there with classmates and friends is really fun. A few of my favourite spots would be the Canterbury Cat Cafe. Happy Samurai is a really good Japanese restaurant. I'm into K-pop, dance, a load of non-medical, artsy stuff. I'm sure if you eventually come to KMMS, you'll definitely find the right people who have the same interests as you and so nice and just you get to meet your people. Now, I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Philip Chan, KMMS Lead for Admissions. Dr. Chan, can you share the entry requirement headlines and the details of the admissions process for the 2025 entry? Hello, uh, um, I'm Philip Chan, uh, our lead admissions for KMMS, and uh, I'm sure you want to hear something about our admissions process. So if we can go to the first slide, please. Um, as you know, yeah, as you know, um, it is quite difficult to be admitted to medicine. And that's because there are many more students, suitable students, who would want to do medicine than there are places. So it is a selective course. And so and um, from our point of view, we have a problem. There are, we have to select from the many applicants the few that we can actually give places to. And the selection problem goes a bit like this, that um, because medicine is quite a demanding career and you have to pass a lot of exams in your life, not just at medical school, but even after you graduate in order to specialize, that selection leans towards exam results. So the people who tend to get selected are those with the highest exam results. In our country, that creates a bit of a problem because in the UK at school, exam results tend to be good in certain schools and not so much in other schools. And uh, that reinforces the inequalities that we see in society. And as you see, there are these incredible statistics uh, in bold on this slide, all of which come from government documents. So none of this is actually made up by anybody. These are actually all part of government reports. So we have a situation in which, and if you look at the graph, uh, that all courses at university seem have uh, an imbalance of students from more privileged areas of the country to those from the less privileged areas. And so the more privileged areas in orange and the less privileged areas in, in blue. And as you see, that is the case with things like engineering and courses like law, but it is accentuated in medicine and dentistry, which is definitely uh, a, uh, a course in which there is the more privileged students completely outnumber the less privileged. And that is because medicine is more selective and tends to offer to the highest grade achievers. So many young people who would be great doctors have diminished chances of entering the profession, really because of education advantage at school. Next, par uh, next slide, please. So we have a system which is not fair, uh, that operates nationwide to the detriment of most people in society and tends to favour the privileged. So at KMMS, and in fact in all the new medical schools, we are charged with finding new ways of doing admissions, which is less unfair. Our approach is that we use minimum standards like everybody else at GCSE and also at UCAT, which I'll explain in a minute. We don't use predicted grades at all. The reason being that predicted grades are more often wrong than they are right and again tend to favour privileged students over those from less privileged areas. 
We use a standard conditional offer of AAB. This is the lowest conditional offer in the country, and it's based on evidence that students who enter the course with AAB tend to do just as well as students with AAA, and in some cases better, as we will explain. So we have a stage process, which at stage one uh, is to screen for minimum requirements at GCSE or at A-level, depending on which stage you're at in your studies. At stage two, we operate a UCAT threshold, which is on the low side, and it's somewhere around the 50th centile. And in stage 2b, we then contextualise everyone. And I'll explain that in the next slide. And that allows us to draw up a shortlist and to call for interview. Next slide, please. So this is how we contextualise everyone and help you understand. Let me just uh, take you through a little thought experiment. Let's pretend that what you have to do to enter medicine is just to take one test and with a maximum score of 100 and that the Medical Schools Council have got together and determined that the uh, entry minimum requirement is 70 out of 100. However, it's still quite competitive. So the average that, you, that most medical students achieve in order to enter medical school is about 75. So I'm going to give you two candidates, right? candidate A and candidate B. So candidate A has a score of 70 on, this, on the test, and candidate B has a score of 75. So candidate B clearly has a better score and, and actually more close to the score that you need or is thought to need to get into medicine, certainly more than the minimum score. But candidate A does have the minimum score and could get into medical school. Now, before you choose which of these candidates, I just want you to give me a quick word about where they come from. Candidate A comes from a school that's never sent anybody to medical school. And so their average of candidates that do take the test from that school is 50. So it's way below what's required. And that's because the schools are really in difficulties. Uh, it's, uh, it's a school that's non-selective. It's a school that draws from a population that is not famous for, uh, for progressing young people into higher education. It's a school where the teaching is not of high quality um, and that you've got the maths teacher who's actually really the PE teacher and ha they haven't had a chemistry teacher in a decade. Whereas candidate B comes from a fabulous school uh, and the average school candidate from that school actually scores 80 on this test. So in fact, B's score is slightly below average for their school, even though way above what's required. And that's because the school is wonderful. I mean, it's fantastic in every way. It has a brilliant record of sending students to competitive courses and to, to medicine in particular. It has fantastic teaching, experienced teachers, excellent preparation for their GCSEs and for their A-levels. And, uh, and, and is wonderful in every way. So I'm going to ask you in, in the chat, if you wouldn't mind, right, uh, uh, to please just write who you're going to vote for, A or B. Who should get the one place that's left uh, to, to go forward into, med in, into medical selection? Who would you vote for? Candidate A or candidate B? I can't actually see the votes, and so I'm going to wait for uh, uh, for um, uh, uh, for a report right, to tell me how you voted, and then we'll move to the next slide. Anybody going to tell me how uh, how the voting went? In at the moment. If you'd like to come back to them at the end, just to give everyone time to writing their answers. Okay. Um, it would really help me to, to, uh, to progress to actually know what the audience think. I've just got the feedback. We have a couple for B and we've got one for A at the moment. Oh, okay. 
that's very interesting that you tend to vote for B because um, because most audiences uh, do go for A and uh, and and that's actually what we do is that we've changed our admission system so that we would actually give that place to A and this is how we do it uh, we act if you are pre A level we will look at your GCSE results and we look at a score called attainment eight which basically is eight GCSE scores to include compulsory subjects and uh, five compulsory and three optional subjects and we compare that to the average of the school in which you sat your GCSE so we we'll look at your relative attainment not your absolute attainment so there are cases in which people with with lower grades actually rank higher than people with higher grades because they have outperformed their school average if you're post a level same concept we compare the, your a level results to your school's average a level results if you are a postgraduate uh, we could do that but to do so we would end up admitting everybody from certain universities and certain courses and nobody from other universities and other courses so in fact we actually do another thing we actually do a scoring system and that scoring system does include things such as uh, uh, kent education and re re residence uh, whether you've worked full-time for the nhs and whether and we also ask you to do an online situational judgment test which is called casper we've used that now for four years if you cannot be contextualized for a variety of reasons such as you have no GCSEs or uh, qualifications done abroad or sometimes your school doesn't publish results and that's the case for Scottish and some Northern Irish schools we will again treat you as uh, and uh, we will probably ask you to do the online situational judgment test what we end up with as you'll see is that we never ask you whether you are in the category of widening participation students we'll never ask you uh, what school, where you live or what school you go to, because we already have that. We'll never ask you about parental income. We'll never ask you uh, about ethnicity, about your uh, asylum seeker status or, or whether or not you're a forces leaver. We'll never ask any of those questions because we do not use that in selection. We do not treat one group of people differently to any other. We just apply the same rule to everybody. Next slide, please. We do use personal statements, but we only use them uh, for the borderline. So at every stage, stage one, two, three, and, uh, and then making an offer, we will look at the borderline applicants uh, who are just sitting on either side of the borderline, looking for people with exceptional achievements or who have overcome exceptional circumstances in order to pass them to the next stage. So we read about a hundred or so statements at each stage so about 300 total next slide please and our interviews are multiple mini interview types uh, so you are selected for them through the contextualize everyone process but once you arrive in an interview everybody is equal again and whether or not you get an offer will depend largely on uh, apart from the, the previous statement made in the previous slide uh, on your performance at the interview we have seven stations, six of which are short stations lasting seven minutes each. And the last one is a long group station lasting 40 minutes. And each station is not marked on a simple scale. It's marked on a very complicated scale, which is a matrix where there are domains and descriptors of each performance. So for example, if the task at one of the small stations was describing something X, uh, there could be a domain saying your emotional approach to describing X. And these are the descriptors and the examiner, the assessor is asked to choose what closely approximates to the behavior that they've just witnessed. And that that will carry a mark uh, back uh, in, uh, but not, not apparent to the examiner. The group station usually has seven or eight applicants and a KMMS facilitator. It is a discussion based task. And the assessors are generally in the room or in the case of overseas applicants in the virtual room uh, marking applicants individually and next slide please so our approach leads to a very different kind of student 
uh, in the entrant group. Uh, we have fairly similar male to female ratios, right, which is about 65% female, right, uh, averaged over the last three years. We do have a somewhat a higher percentage of graduates right, uh, than, than otherwise, because they tend to perform quite well in an interview because they're a bit older and they just have more experience. And they're an average about a third graduates and two thirds school leavers. But the most interesting thing is this widening participation business. Uh, the Kent WP definition covers 42% of UK postcodes. And um, over the last three years, we've admitted 35% on average who are widening participation of students, which far exceeds the national average, where most students are selected purely on exam results. So compared to standard selection, that we did the same as most people, we would actually only be looking at about about one um, so three quarters of the candidates that we actually bring to interview would not be interviewed by others other medical school so that is how KMS differs in the way that we select people we use a relative attainment and that is quite important and we use a very different looking MMI interview so um, uh, I'm happy to wrap it up there next slide please and um, uh, and go for questions. Yeah. yeah, and go for questions. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Just to let you know, we ended up finishing with more votes for the letter A. Please note if you have any personal admission questions, please email admi admissions at kmms.ac.uk. And please also take a look at the KMMS website for more details of their entry requirements www.kmms.ac.uk. Dr. Chan, I will just ask you a couple of questions that have come in sure. um, before we invite the KMMS students back to join us. So the entry level requirements for A-level are lower than most of the other medical schools. Why is this? Um, that's because it's evidence-based. We know from quite recent evidence on UK medical students that, uh, that entrants at AAB perform just as well as entrants from AAA. And in fact, they perform better if they come from schools that have low performance averages. And so the very group that we favor tend to actually do better than people who achieve grades higher than AAA. So it's, it's evidence-based. I, I would say, I would reverse the question. I would ask what the evidence is for other medical schools to ask for higher levels of performance for their incoming medical students, because that is not necessary to perform well on the course. Thank you. And I'll just move on to our second question. What is the main thing you look for in your applications? I think, obviously, we have so many applicants that we have to deal with the minimum requirements and then with the UCAT threshold and then with the relative attainment. And all of those are done quantitatively. But then we'll come to an interview group right, where the judgment then becomes qualitative. So. A good way of thinking about it is one is the first bit of selection is based on your academic achievement, although in KMS we're looking at your relative academic achievement, whereas the, the final bit is actually based on your non academic traits, your character, your values, your personality. And arguably that's more important because that determines whether or not you're going to get an offer after an interview. Thank you, Dr. Chan. In a few minutes, we'll be welcoming back our students, Hannah and Zainab, to answer some questions that you might have, so make sure to keep them coming into YouTube and Facebook. In the meantime, here's another short film. Hello, my name is Olivia France. I'm the lecturer in anatomy here at KMMS. We are in the ALC, which is the Anatomy Learning Centre, so it's our custom-built centre for the teaching of human anatomy. Um, but it's, it's an amazing space. We've got a dry lab, which we're currently in at the moment, um, and with capacity generally for small group teaching. Um, again, the use of plastic models, textbooks, iPads, but through the doors, um, we have our dissection room. Um, in there we have 11 tables, which we have for our full body cadaveric dissection. And that's where our medical students will learn predominantly all their um, anatomical knowledge throughout the two years that they're taught it on the programme. KMMS students learn human anatomy, 
So they learn top to toe anatomy of the human body. So in years one, they have three modules. The first module, um, in terms of the actual anatomical knowledge which they learn, is more superficial. It's more about the introduction, the fundamentals of the different body systems. Um, but then from the second semester or trimester onwards, they start to actually learn what's called systems-based. So in year one, they have HLB, which is heart, lungs and blood. So that's looking at the respiratory and the cardiovascular systems. Then after Easter, they do NME, which is nutrition, metabolism and excretion. So that's much more focused on the alimentary or gastrointestinal system. In the FHD module, which is the Foundations of Health and Disease, that's their first opportunity to actually come in and see the space and meet the cadavers. So the very first session is really important. It's, you know, it's invaluable for them to just get to grips with what we do here, the human tissue, but also they start to learn those surgical skills or those dissection skills. So we have like a three hour session, they meet the cadaver and they get the opportunity to practice dissection on different forms of fruit. So they have oranges, bananas, um, and again, it's just about them utilizing the tools to actually get a hang of how to hold them, how to manipulate the tools, how to manipulate the tissue. So again, then every session that builds on that, they get to develop that fine motor skill. We have textbooks, we have iPads, we have models. On the iPads, we have an app called Complete Anatomy, which is a 3D digital way of manipulating um, the human body. So the students can add layers, they can strip layers off, um, effectively a virtual dissection on a little iPad. Yearly, we hold our KMMS service of Thanksgiving. So it's an opportunity for staff and students, and again, not just KMMS, but also those at Canterbury Christchurch and up at Kent, to come and actually demonstrate that gratitude for this really altruistic gift which these donors have, have given to us to better the students' education and this whole you know, experience of learning. It's incredible. It really is incredible. And we, you know, we are so grateful that we have these people that will do this for us and our students. I'm joined again by Hannah and Zeynep. Thank you for still being with us. We have a few more questions as we come towards the end. Hannah, I'm going to start with a question for you. Do you get much time during the holidays to relax or will there be further readings during this time? This viewer asks as well, would you say the course is quite intense? Yeah, you've got time to go on holiday. I booked a last minute holiday yesterday. Um, yeah, it is what you make it. I think it's really important to make the effort to prioritise your social life. It can get quite consuming and you can drag medicine out of you know the whole year if you want to. But it's really important that uh, you do make the most of the time that you have, especially, you know, you're not working yet. You're at uni. Definitely, you know, there's lots of time to join societies. I'd especially encourage it in the first two years when you're definitely on campus. Just make the most of the social life. There's definitely time for that. And then I'd say, you know, let your studying fit in around that and it'll be more efficient anyway. Um, and the other question, sorry, what was that? Oh, is it intense course? It is an intense course. I think that that's well known for medicine, but it's manageable. I think it sort of hits you a bit of a truckload uh, in the first year, but you're all in the same boat. You do get used to it um, and you go through it with everyone uh, and you just, you know, build your revision strategy so they become more effective as you go along um, so you learn how to learn and uh, yeah if you're enjoying what you're doing um, it's not a it's not a hardship as such. Thank you very much for our next question I'm going to come to you Zeynep. Uh, this viewer has asked do students get assistance with getting into placements such as taxis? Oh yeah of course um, you well it's it's dependent on how far it is or where it is. I think that's the most important thing. Um, a lot of them generally do have access with public transport and that transport generally is um, reimbursed. So if you do um, pay out of your own pocket, that does go back to you. Um, and a lot of them, if your distance is longer than an hour and a half by transport, public transport, then they give you access to funding so you can reimburse, so you can claim back the money that you spend on accommodation, um, which of course has its limit, but which is, you know, it's one of the greatest impacts. It's the best part of it, really. 
Thank you, that's really helpful to know. I have a couple more questions for both of you, but we'll start with Hannah first. What advice would you give to someone considering applying for the medicine this year? Oh, I could give you all sorts of advice. I think my main advice would be to make sure you really know what the job of a doctor is like, what it entails. Um, I don't mean this at you, but for me, the only experience that I had as a hospital up until a certain point was sort of Grey's Anatomy. And then I went and did some work experience and it's a very, it's a very different situation. Um, so I'd encourage you just to get lots of experience. I know it's really hard when you're sort of not 18 and things, but to be persistent and to get lots of different hospital and GP sort of work experience, just so you know what the job entails, because med school is one thing, being a doctor is another thing. Um, yeah, and just sort of being aware of what, it's not a glamorous job, but, but you know, it's good in so many ways. So just make sure it's a good fit. And I think that's the advice I'd give. Um, and obviously you've got to optimize your chances. So just do your research into which medical school sort of admissions and, and location and things would suit you. Thank you. And I'm going to ask Philip the same thing. What advice would you give to someone, Philip? Well, I think um, fundamentally it's to, um, it's to achieve as well as you can at school. Um, I think many people, uh, young people of school age are very focused on this anyway. Uh, but it is particularly important with medicine being so competitive that just do the best you can. Um, there may be limitations because of the school environment you find yourself in, but at least Care and Best will take that into account. Uh, but do the very best you can, get involved, uh, express yourself, but also make sure that you don't sort of take your eye off the main item, which is to do well at school. Thank you. Um, Designer, we'll come back to you. What was the biggest challenge for you during the admissions process? I think it was the waiting um, and there was this constant urge of wanting to ask if there'd be any updates or if there'd be any more offers coming out. I think that was the biggest, um, that was the biggest challenge for me. I think it's just holding on tight and actually going in with zero expectations because I mean, KMS themselves do actually a great job at building those expectations and um, even extending them. So they, I think it'd be best to go in with zero expectations, but keep the excitement and be prepared, like both mentally and, you know, emotionally be prepared for everything that's going to come through with the course in itself. Um, and then just go forward from there, really just keep waiting and hanging on. Thank you. We have another question that's just come through. It says, how were your interview experiences and how long did you have to wait until you received your offer? Hannah, let's start with you. Um, so my interview experiences were, um, I think, they were okay. I think they were quite similar, the three that I did in terms of that they were all MMIs. Um, I prepared with the MMI interview book that's quite a classic, and I'd say that was helpful. Um, and I think it's nice, you sort of get a feel for the place at the interview, um, and then following on from that, a feel for the place at the offer holder day, but it's an opportunity to meet people and things. Um, I actually, I can't remember how long I waited for my offer. I don't think it was too long. Obviously they do come out in batches. Um, but yeah, when I opened that email, I was not expecting to see being accepted at all. So that was, uh, that was a nice email to receive. <laughs> Saying that, but what was your experience? Um, I think I waited about two months um, before I got my, um, unconditional offer and um, because I'm a postgrad student um, but with the MMIs I truly went in with zero expectations I had zero preparation because I had no idea what to expect um, but I know I definitely left um, just saying I had so much fun and um, I think you if you go in there with a positive mentality and actually work through things um, systematically and and make sense of it as you're going through it's not that bad um, and it's a lot of fun. I, I truly had a lot of fun. So I, I mean, I'd recommend it even, <laughs> even if you don't know what the results is going to be, I'd recommend going through it anyway. So it was fun. So you're in both of your answers, you both mentioned about like preparation for it. Philip, do you mind just jumping in and maybe some advice on how people can prepare for this stuff? Yeah. Um, 
again, our MMI is quite different to everybody else's, and so I hesitate uh, to. Uh, but I, I must say that that the 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 advice that we give is for KMMS, but probably doesn't work for anybody else's interviews. Um, for KMMS, we're more interested in 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 your character values and personality and less interested in how much preparation you've done and how well crafted your answers are so we don't ask you simple predictable questions which you can rehearse answers to we actually advise you not to prepare because we'd rather test the true you and find out who you are right, rather than some kind of facade that you've put up and at least then like Zainab you have the 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 satisfaction of know, and knowing that if we offer you, that's because we really like you. Thank you all for joining us today. Well, that's about time we've all got for this afternoon. Thank you again to all our panellists for taking part, but most of all, thank you at home for sending in your questions. Hopefully, we've been able to answer them for you. If you want to find out more, you can go to www.kmms.ac.uk, email admissions at kmms.ac.uk, or follow the handle KMMS Med School on social media. Just to repeat, that's www.kmms.ac.uk. The email's admissions at kmms.ac.uk, or follow the handle KMMS Med School on social media. That's all from me. Thank you for watching the Kent and Medway Med Medway School Virtual Open Day. We hope to see you here in 2025.